Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. And Father, as we open your holy word, we ask, we plead for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Give us, Lord, clarity of thought, and give us also willing hearts to receive your word. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The title of our study today is The Abomination of Desolation. Now in our last study we touched briefly upon the abomination of desolation as it related to the first destruction of Jerusalem in the year 586. But in our study today we are going to deal with the second destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. And we cannot understand the destruction of the city unless we understand the events that led up to the destruction of the city. And so what we're going to do is begin our study in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 5. And we're going to notice a clear line of events in sequence. One event right after another. Also, I must warn you that we're not going to read texts exclusively from the Gospel of Matthew. Wherever Mark or Luke add information to what we have in Matthew, I'm going to also include the perspective of Mark and Luke. So we're going to study the sequence of events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem from the perspective of the three Gospels. Let's begin our study at Matthew chapter 24 and verses 5 through 8. This is what I call the preliminary signs. It says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. In various places, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Notice that these are preliminary signs. The worst is yet to come, is what Jesus is saying. Notice several signs here. False Christs, wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Now what I would like to do is take each of these signs individually and show you how in the New Testament and also in history, primarily through the writings of Josephus and the Roman historian Tacitus, these signs were fulfilled leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. First of all, let's talk about false Christs and false prophets. Notice Acts chapter 5 in verses 36 and 37. Here we find the names, the specific names of two of those false prophets that arose between the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem. It says there, For some time ago Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and drew away many people after him, he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So you have two false prophets that are mentioned here by name, or false Christs, Theudas and Judas of Galilee. Now in Acts chapter 8 verses 9 and 10 we find another false prophet. His name of course, Simon Magus, or Simon the Magician. Notice Acts 8 verses 9 and 10. But there was a certain man named Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. In the book, The Desire of Ages, page 628, where Ellen White describes the destruction of Jerusalem, she says this, Many false messiahs will appear, claiming to work miracles, and declaring that the time of the deliverance of the Jewish nation has come. These will mislead many. Then she says, 
Christ's words were fulfilled. Between his death and the siege of Jerusalem, many false messiahs appeared. Notice also the testimony of Flavius Josephus, who was a Jewish historian born in the year 37 AD, several decades before the destruction of Jerusalem. He said this, Moreover, impostors and deceivers called upon the mob to follow them into the desert. For they said that they would show them unmistakable marvels and signs that would be wrought in harmony with God's designs. Also in the book Wars of the Jews, Josephus says this, Deceivers and impostors, under the pretense of divine inspiration, fostering revolutionary changes, they persuaded the multitude to act like madmen and led them out into the desert under the belief that God would give them tokens of deliverance. Once again Josephus in his work Antiquities of the Jews had this to say about false prophets that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem. He said in Judea matters were constantly going from bad to worse. For the country was again infested with bands of brigands and impostors who deceived the mob. So there were false Christs and false prophets by the testimony of Scripture and also by the testimony of Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian. Now what about wars and rumors of wars and social unrest? There was much of that as well. You know Jesus was born during the period of what has come to be known as the Pax Romana, in other words the Roman peace. And according to Roman historians this period from 17 BC during the emperorship of Augustus all the way till the year 67 under Nero there was an unparalleled peace in the history of the Roman Empire. That is until Nero sent Vespasian the, his general to quench the rebellion that was taking place in the city of Jerusalem. And then everything fell into disarray. Everything fell apart and no longer was there peace anywhere. There were natural disasters everywhere as we're going to notice. In fact there were many wars because Vespasian as was his policy as he went to Jerusalem he finished off every nation that he found in the way so that they would not interfere in the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact Josephus says that it was his strategy to leave nothing outside of Jerusalem behind him that might interrupt in the siege. There are many wars. Notice Desire of Ages page 628. Prior to the destruction of Jerusalem men wrestled for the supremacy. Emperors were murdered those supposed to be standing next to the throne were slain. There were wars and rumors of wars. In fact we know that the Jews themselves had battles with the Ascalonians, the Samaritans, the Alexandrians, and the Syrians just a few years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Tacitus, the great Roman historian who lived from the year 55 till the year 117, A.D. had this to say about this period. He said, the history on which I am entering is that of a period rich in disasters, terrible in battles, torn by civil struggles, horrible even in peace. Four emperors failed by the sword. There were three civil wars, more foreign wars, and often both at the same time. And Josephus had this to say, all was in disorder after the death of Nero. And so there were great numbers of wars and rumors of wars that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem both according to scripture and also according to the Jewish historian Josephus and the Roman historian Tacitus. Now what about famines and pestilences between the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem? In Acts chapter 11 and verse 28 we find the mention of one of these horrendous famines. It says there in Acts 11 and verse 28, Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world.
which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. By the way Josephus calls this famine the great famine. And if you read in Antiquities of the Jews as well as in Josephus' book Wars of the Jews he mentions many other famines that also took place around the same time. Ellen White in the book The Great Controversy page 32 concurs with Josephus with these words thousands, speaking about Jerusalem, thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affection seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands robbed their wives and wives their husbands. Children would be seen uh, snatching the food from the mouths of their good parents. In fact Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 10 was sung as I mentioned in our last lecture in conjunction with this destruction of Jerusalem. And the book of Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 10 speaks about mothers eating their children because of the severe famine. Notice what it says there, the hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. In fact this was a fulfillment of one of the curses of the covenant that are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 28 in verses 56 and 57. God had said that if Israel did not obey His voice and follow His covenant that things like this would occur. Ellen White in Great Controversy page 31 describes the hunger in the city this way, So fierce were the pangs of hunger that men would gnaw the leather of their belts and sandals and the covering of their shields. Great numbers of the people would steal out at night to gather wild plants growing outside the city walls. Though many were seized and put to death with cruel torture and often those who returned in safety were robbed of what they had gleaned at so great peril. So there were severe famines, terrible hunger, especially once the city of Jerusalem was besieged. Now what about earthquakes and supernatural phenomena? We're following the order of the phenomena that we read at the beginning of our study. Tacitus, the Roman historian in his book The Annals of Tacitus, describes earthquakes in Crete, Rome, Apamea, Phrygia, Campania, and Laodicea, and also Pompeii just before the destruction of Jerusalem. That's a lot of earthquakes in a lot of places. In fact Tacitus described one of these earthquakes during the emperorship of Claudius. He says this, houses were flattened by repeated earthquakes and as terror spread the weak were trampled to death by the panic panic stricken. The Roman writer Seneca speaks of quakes that took place in Asia, Achaia, Syria, and Macedonia. In fact Ellicott the great commentator said this about this period between the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem. These are his words, perhaps no period in world's history has ever been so marked by these conditions, that is earthquakes, as that which intervenes between the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem. Flavius Josephus says this about this period and these supernatural phenomena. I quote, There broke out a prodigious storm in the night with the utmost violence and very strong winds with the largest showers of rain and continual lightnings, terrible thunderings, and amazing concussions and bellowings of the earth that was in an earthquake. In fact Josephus as he observed all these signs he reached the, con the conclusion that these signs must be indicating something terrible that was going to happen to Jerusalem. These are his words, these things were a manifest indication that some destruction was coming upon men. When the system of the world was put into this disorder, and anyone would guess that these wonders foreshadowed some grand calamities that were coming. Now there's a detail that's not mentioned in Matthew, and I brought this out in our first study together, and that is that there were also going to be troubles. 
The word troubles describes social unrest. Notice Mark chapter 13 and verse 8. Mark chapter 13 verse 8, there were going to be troubles and riots and tumult and civil unrest. This is what Mark 13 verse 8 says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines, and then it says what? and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. That word troubles is the same word that is used to describe the mob that cried out crucify him, crucify him. You know where there was more and more disorder and more tumult among the crowd. Now Josephus tells us that during this period there was a great increase in messianic movements in the Judean wilderness. In fact Josephus says that during the reign of Felix that uh, a succession of deceivers and impostors fomented revolutionary changes under the pretext of divine inspiration. Ellen White vividly describes this period in Great Controversy page 28 with these words, Satan aroused the fiercest and most debased passions of the soul. Men did not reason, they were beyond reason controlled by impulse and blind rage. They became satanic in their cruelty. In the family and in the nation, among the highest and the lowest classes alike, there was suspicion, envy, hatred, strife, rebellion, and murder. There was no safety anywhere. Friends and kindred betrayed one another. Parents slew their children, and children their parents. Does this sound impressive? What was happening shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem? It's unbelievable, and yet we need to understand that this is going to occur again. And it's going to occur on a global scale in the order in which we have studied these things. And yet Jesus goes on to say, don't worry folks, these are only the beginning of sorrows. You say, wow, if this is the beginning of sorrows, what comes next? Well the fact is that all of these calamities according to Matthew were going to be blamed upon God's people. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9 immediately after all of these disasters and when Jesus says this is but the beginning of sorrows we find the hidden agenda of the devil causing these things. It says there in Matthew 24 and verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Is there a connection between the previous signs and this? Yes. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So all of these calamities are actually caused by Satan with the intent that God's people would be blamed for everything that was happening in the natural world, in society, and in the political world as well as in the religious world. Between the death of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem, God's people were mercilessly persecuted. For example, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, we find Peter and John being persecuted. It says there in Acts chapter 5 verse 41, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. See, the shame is for the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, we find reference to a great persecution. It says there, Now Saul was consenting to his death, that is to Stephen's death, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. We all know about the persecutions of Saul of Tarsus against the church of God. By the way Jesus had predicted this that many individuals would seek God's people to kill them thinking that they were actually doing God a favor. Do you remember the words of Caiaphas where Caiaphas says it's necessary for one man to die and not for the nation to disappear or to be destroyed? There he revealed that he thought that Jesus was going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem and they needed to get rid of Jesus. But by getting rid of, rid of Jesus that eventually led to what? That eventually led to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. By the way, 
we know that Peter was crucified and we know that Paul was beheaded both of them because of their faith in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 Jesus predicted that many of God's people would be persecuted in the name of righteousness. It says there, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God, what? That he offers God service. Now you notice as we compare the Gospel of Mark that this persecution would lead God's people to be taken before kings and rulers to witness for their faith. In other words, the calamities would call pers cause persecution, but the persecution would lead God's people to be in the presence of kings and rulers to testify before them. Notice Mark chapter 13 and verse 9. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. In other words, the persecution was meant to get rid of God's people, but by the persecution, actually God's people were led to give testimony before the great political and religious rulers of the world. And thus it was that the Apostle Paul appeared before Felix. Notice Acts 24 and verses 24 and 25. Acts 24 and verses 24 and 25. It says, and after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Notice that he was shaken up by the message that the Apostle Paul gave him. The question is, why was he shaken up? The reason is very simple. God gave Paul and Peter and all those who appeared before the kings the gift of the Holy Spirit so that they could witness with power. Notice also the testimony of the appearance of the Apostle Paul before King Agrippa. Notice for his faith he's appearing before the king. It says in Acts chapter 26 and verses 1 to 3, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you all concerning the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. And we're told in the book Acts of the Apostles that also King Agrippa shook at the testimony that the Apostle Paul gave him. And he even said, Almost persuadest thou me to be what? To be a Christian. We know also that the Apostle Paul appeared before the Emperor Nero. Now it was in God's providence that these calamities take place and that persecution come so that God's people could be in the courts of kings to witness for God. And when the emergency came, God gave His people wisdom and the Holy Spirit to speak with power. I want you to remember all of these things because the pattern in the end time will be identical. Notice Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. Mark 13 and verse 11. Notice how they received the aid of the Holy Spirit. And by the way this is in the same sequence of Matthew 24. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but whom? but the Holy Spirit. What did God give them the power of the Holy Spirit to speak? Yes. Is this going to happen in the end time also? Is God going to pour out His Spirit so that God's people can speak in the midst of huge persecutions? Yes, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want you to be thinking forwards, not only to history. This is the foundation, this is the basis for what we're going to study in the future. See, you can't know what's going to happen in the future unless you see the pattern as it occurred in the past. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now notice Luke chapter 21, 14 and 15. We find another example of this. 
and how God gives wisdom to speak in times of emergency. Luke 21 verses 14 and 15. Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. In other words, don't prepare your speech. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Isn't that marvelous? In other words, your, your wisdom, which will be my wisdom, will be so powerful that no one will be able to contradict it. We're also told that as a result of this testimony which was given, God's people would be hated with an even greater hatred than before. In fact we're told that Christians would be betrayed by their own friends and by their own relatives. Notice Mark chapter 13 and verse 12, I want you to remember this because in the end time God's people are also going to be hated by their relatives and by their friends. Mark 13 and verse 12 it says, Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. You say, this is impossible, Pastor Bohr, that children would betray their parents to death? That's exactly what happened, and that's exactly what's going to happen in the end time as well, to those who truly follow Jesus. Notice also, also Matthew 10, 34 to 37, Jesus had predicted this, Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 to 37. Here Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. You see Jesus and his message brings division it brings hatred, and God's people had to testify in the midst of great opposition. In the book Desire of Ages, page 629, we find this vivid description. Fathers and mothers betrayed their children. Children betrayed their parents. Friends delivered their friends up to the Sanhedrin. The persecutors wrought out their purpose by killing Stephen, James, and other Christians. Now the next sign that's mentioned in Matthew 24 is that when persecution came and God's people had to testify, many of God's people would be offended at Jesus and would be shaken out. There was going to be a shaking in other words. There were going to be many who were in the faith that would forsake the faith. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. And by the way this is in the context of the persecution that is mentioned in the previous verses. It says, and then, notice the word then, because of the persecution, then many will be what? Will be offended. In other words, they're going to leave the faith, will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. By the way, this happened in real cases between the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem. You remember when the Apostle Paul was in his second imprisonment in Rome, there was an individual who had embraced the faith, his name was Demas, and notice what the Apostle Paul had to say about Demas. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. In fact the Apostle Paul says that during his second imprisonment nobody was with him, everyone had forsaken him. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, At my first defense no one stood with me, but all forsook me, may it not be charged against them. Actually the Apostle John had described this moment. He described the case of many people who were among God's people, but were not part of God's people. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. 1 John 2 and verse 19. Here John says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now in this context also Jesus predicted that many false prophets would arise. In fact these false prophets especially were those who told the people in Jerusalem, don't worry God is with us, God is going to deliver us from the Romans. In fact they preached peace 
peace. This is the same thing that the false prophets did leading up to the des destruction of the first Jerusalem as we noticed in our previous study. Matthew 24 and verse 11 Notice what Jesus had to say about false prophets rising and trying to get God's people to abandon the faith and to follow them. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Ellen White in her book Desire of Ages page 631 says this about the false prophets and I quote, false prophets did rise deceiving the people and leading great numbers into the desert magicians and sorcerers claiming miraculous power drew the people after them into the mountain solitudes by the way in the end time there are also going to be false prophets we'll notice this when we study Matthew 24, 23 and 24 false prophets would arise and they would deceive if possible Jesus said even the very elect in Great Controversy page 29 Ellen White said this, she said, the religious leaders bribed false prophets to proclaim even while Roman legions were besieging the temple that the people were to wait for deliverance from God. Even while the temple was being destroyed these false prophet was go prophets were saying we are going to be delivered by God. And Flavius Josephus had this to say, now it came to pass while Phaedus was procurator in Judea that a certain magician whose name was Theudas persuaded a great part of the people to take their effects with them and follow him to the river Jordan for he told them he was a prophet and that he would by his own command divide the river and afford them passage over it and many were deluded by his words. By the way the book, Acts, uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles mentions one of these false prophets Acts chapter 13 and verse 6 says this, Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Peter also predicted false prophets during this period. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Jesus also spoke about a tremendous increase in lawlessness and he said that the love of many would grow cold. Now it's interesting if the love was going to grow cold it must mean that at one time they had love and that the love was warm because something can't grow cold unless it was warm before and it's because of the increase in lawlessness that the love grows cold. In fact notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold. And so now Jesus calls for endurance. The Lord Jesus says you're going to need endurance mainly for three reasons, because according to the context there has been persecution, there has been deception, and there has been a love growing cold and so Jesus is going to say now if you're going to remain firm you're going to need patience or endurance you can't allow persecution you can't allow deception and you can't allow your love to grow cold let me ask you does the book of Revelation speak about a special patience or endurance that God's people are going to need in the end time in order not to be deceived, in order for their love to stay hot, and in order for them to withstand persecution when it arises? You know that text, here is the patience of the saints, here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So Jesus calls for endurance. In fact in uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 19 we find the parallel passage, Luke says, by your patience possess your souls. And then comes a very important sign. It's found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And probably you've read this verse, you can recite it from memory. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In other words, God's people would preach the message, and the message would reach every corner of the world of that time. 
Now the word world that is used here is not the common word for world. You know you have the word cosmos uh, which refers to the planet itself. Uh, you have also the word ion which refers to the world in its temporal composition. The word here is oikumene, it refers to the inhabited world. In other words when it says and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world it's speaking about the inhabitants of the world. Now let me ask you the question, was the gospel preached to the whole world in apostolic times before the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes it was. Notice Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, Colossians 1 and verse 23 if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Now notice this, the Apostle Paul is speaking, he says which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. So did the gospel go to every creature before the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes. Is it going to go to the whole world at the end of time? Yes it is. Notice Romans chapter 1 and verse 8. Romans chapter 1 and verse 8 repeats the same idea that the gospel went to the whole world. Here the Apostle Paul says first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of where? Throughout the whole world. Now we've come to the point that we want to dedicate most of our study to and that is Matthew 24 and verse 15. Have you noticed all of the preliminary things that are taking place here? Have you, have you gathered the sequence of events that are taking place here? You have all of these disasters, these disasters lead to what? They lead to persecution, God's people witness, God gives them the power of His Holy Spirit to witness, He gives them a, wi a, a wisdom which cannot be withstood, they preach the gospel to the whole world, false prophets and deceivers arise, many are offended, many drop away from the faith. Does this scenario sound similar to something that you've heard about the end time? You know it is a blueprint of what is going to take place in the end time as we'll notice in our next studies. Now we want to deal with the abomination of desolation. It's mentioned in Matthew 24 and verse 15. Go with me there, Matthew 24 and verse 15. And we touched upon this in our previous lecture. It says here, therefore when you see, is the abomination something that can be seen? According to this, yes. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by whom? by Daniel the prophet standing where? in the holy place whoever reads let him understand. Four things that I want us to know is here. First of all it could be seen. Secondly it's called the abomination of desolation. Third it was spoken of by Daniel and fourth it stands in the holy place. Now where do we need to go to know what this abomination of desolation is? Obviously we would have to go back to Daniel because it was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now do you remember in our last lecture that we studied about how Daniel predicted that Jerusalem would be destroyed a second time? How it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar but after 70 years there were promises that God's people were going to return, they were going to rebuild the temple, they were going to rebuild the city, they were going to rebuild the walls, and God was going to give them another chance, another chance to obey His voice and follow His covenant. You remember that? But also we noticed at the end of Daniel chapter 9 that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed a what? A second time. In fact let's read that, Daniel 9 verses 26 and 27. The famous prophecy of the 70 weeks. It says, and after the 62 weeks Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Was Jerusalem going to be destroyed again according to this? Absolutely the end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of war, of the war, what? What's the word there? Desolations are determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and notice what the result is, and on the wing of what? abominations shall be one who makes, there's the word again, desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the what? desolate. Did you notice the number of times that the word abomination and desolate are used in these verses? Is this, re is this referring to what was going to happen with Jerusalem when it was going to be destroyed the second time? Absolutely. 
abomination would lead to what? would lead to desolation. But the question is, what was this abomination that led to desolation? Well Luke 21 and verse 20 gives us the explanation and the answer. That's why it's nice to have more than one gospel. Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. Here Luke expresses it in a different way. But when you see, was that in Matthew? Seeing? Yes. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by what? Armies. What is the abomination then? It's Jerusalem what? Surrounded by armies. So they could see when they saw the abomination of desolation which was what? The surrounding of Jerusalem by armies then know that it's what? That it's desolation is near. So let me ask you, was the abomination set up inside the city or outside the city? It was outside. It was the, where the Roman armies were. When you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, which is the abomination, you can know that the desolation of the city of Jerusalem is near. Now the question is, what is it that these armies had that could be called an abomination. The fact is folks that we're told by Josephus as well as other historians that what the people in the city saw was the Romans coming and placing their standards in the ground as they surrounded the city of Jerusalem and then they bowed and they worshiped the standards that they carried in front of their legions. In other words they worshiped them, saying that the, the being that was represented by the standards was actually going to give them the victory over the city of Jerusalem. Now allow me to read you from Luke 19 41 to 44 how uh, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed because of their rejection of the Messiah. Luke 19 41 to 44. It says, Now as he drew near, Jesus that is, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come when you, w upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. Is that the same surrounding of Jerusalem in Luke 21? Yes. Verse 44, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now you say, what did those standards have on them? Here we're reaching a very important point in our study that we need to remember because in our next lecture we're going to come back to this in the context of the end time. Great Controversy page 26 we find this description and then I'm going to read you a statement a little bit later on from Josephus. Ellen White says this, When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. What was it that they saw in the standards? An eagle. Interesting. She says, when the idolatrous standards of the Romans, in fact, Great Controversy, page 41, she speaks about these standards, and she says, the gospel penetrate into the regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. What was the ensign that Nebuchadnezzar had when he came to destroy Jerusalem in the Old Testament? Do you remember? It was an eagle. Now you have a new general, pagan general, who's coming also with what? with eagles for the second destruction of Jerusalem. Now allow me to give you a little history about the Roman standard with the eagle and tell you a little bit about it. Until the year 104 BC the, the Romans had many different animals on their standards. Uh, you know some standards had bulls or snakes or lions or vultures, many different kinds of animals. But after the year 104 
BC they standardized it and all of the Roman legions had eagles on their standards. In fact in the year 63 the great Roman general Pompey deified the standards. In others he made the standards uh, represent the God that was on the standard. And by the way that God was the sun god Mithra. It was the same God that was worshipped by Constantine the Great both before and after he became a Christian. Now the interesting thing is that if you look at the Roman standard and in the DVD presentation there's going to be an illustration of it, you'll find an eagle on the standard and the eagle is facing right. The head of the eagle is facing right. The wings of the eagle are outstretched and surrounding the eagle is a circular wreath which is golden. In other words it is a, it is a golden wreath, round in the talons of the eagle it has arrows. Now that's interesting, you have an eagle facing right, it has around it a golden wreath which by the way represents the orb of the sun, and then you have the eagle with arrows in its talons. Now why is this important? because we're going to notice that later on in history there's another nation represented by an eagle who is going to do something relating to the sun. And as a result this abomination will ultimately lead to desolation, not of Jerusalem but of the whole world. Notice what Josephus had to say about the Roman standards. He said, then came the ensigns encom encompassing the eagle, which, he says this, the eagle which is at the head of every Roman legion. What was at the head of every Roman legion? The eagle, the king, and the strongest of all birds, which seems to them, that is to the Romans, a signal of dominion, and an omen that they shall conquer all against whom they march. By the way, do you know that Peter referred to uh, Rome as Babylon? Rome was the new Babylon. Notice 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. Actually we won't read that, well let's do read it. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. Here Peter says, she who is in Babylon, by this time Babylon had been destroyed, the literal Babylon, she who is in Babylon elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark my son. Practically every scholar agrees that when Peter speaks here of Babylon he's cryptically speaking about Rome, because Rome is the new Babylon. And so you have the new Babylon with the eagle ensigns coming against the city of Jerusalem. By the way, the Gospel of Matthew actually mentions the eagles. Have you ever read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28 where it says, where the eagles are, there where the carcasses be found. In other words, the eagles are actually mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28, the eagles of Rome. But you say, okay, so the Christians that were inside the city, they would see this sign of the Romans bringing their standards with the eagle and the sun on it, representing the sun god Mithra, and they would worship the sun god Mithra, and, and they would see this sign, but how could they escape if the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by the Roman armies? Well the fact is, by a miracle of God there was a temporary retreat by the general Cestius. Allow me to read you from Great Controversy, page 30, and then I'm going to read from Josephus because Ellen White is simply referring here to Josephus. Great Controversy, page 30, Ellen White says, after the Romans under Cestius had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege, when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. The besieged, despairing of successful resistance, were on the point of surrender, in other words the Jews were at the point of surrender, when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. Flavius Josephus adds, without having received any disgrace, Cestius retired from the city without any reason in the world. And of course the Jews 
pursued the Roman armies who had left. They said this is the sign of God. The false prophet said, see we told you that God was going to perform a miracle and that the Romans were going to leave. They pursued them and they killed many of the Romans. Why did the Romans flee? Till this day it's a mystery except for the fact that we know that Jesus had said in Matthew that there was going to be a sign and when his people saw the sign they should flee from the city but how could they flee if the Roman armies surrounded the city? The Roman armies had to leave so that God's people could flee and then by the way the Roman armies came back and they did not retreat again and everyone who stayed in the city who did not flee from the city was destroyed in the city of Jerusalem. In fact Josephus tells us that approximately 1.1 million Jews were crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. But we're told by the spirit of prophecy that not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Because they had seen the eagle and the sun and the worship of the Roman armies. They had seen the abomination. They knew desolation was coming because of that. And therefore when the Roman armies retreated they picked up and they left. And therefore when the Roman armies came back they were safe and sound. In fact after this they actually fled to the mountains. Have you ever uh, studied before that there's going to come a time when in a certain country whose emblem is the eagle having something to do with the sun that, that a, a decree is going to be given against them and they're going to have to flee to the mountains. Have you ever heard anything like that? Where did, where did Ellen White get such an idea from? Preposterous, right? Not preposterous. It's typology. What happened will happen. And we're going to study this in our next lecture. In fact notice Matthew 24 verses 16 through 18 immediately after the abomination of desolation is put up when the eagle and the sun is worshiped immediately it says then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. In Great Controversy page 30 we find these words but God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his own people the promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians and now an opportunity was afforded for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Let me ask you, is it important to watch the signs? Only those who watch the sign escape from the city. Because some people today say, oh I'm not interested in what's coming, I'm only interested in who's coming. Well let me tell you, if you're only interested in who's coming and not what's coming, you're going to accept the wrong who. I can assure you that. Because the signs are necessary so that we will not be deceived. Jesus started this sermon by saying, I give this to you so that you will not be what? So that you will not be deceived. By the way, how many groups in the city of Jerusalem Two. Was there a separation before the destruction? Yes there was. Was there a separation before the destruction in the Old Testament story? Was there a sign placed upon God's people? Absolutely. Were they spared when the destruction came? Yes. Also with the second destruction of Jerusalem the same happened. Ellen White says in Great Controversy page 30, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Not one Christian perished. They were all sealed, marked by God as His people, and they escaped. They came out, and therefore they were spared. In fact Josephus describing the destruction of the city had this to say, the mis misfortunes of all men from the beginning of the world He's almost quoting Jesus, from the beginning of the world if they be compared to these of the Jews are not considerable as they were. In other words this was the worst calamity since the beginning of the world is what Josephus is saying. Now I want you to notice one final thing in closing. Do you know that all of those who fled from Jerusalem kept a very special day? <laughs> 
You say, they did? Was the Sabbath involved in the destruction of Jerusalem in the Old Testament? Those who were spared, were they Sabbath keepers? Was the city destroyed because it did not keep the Sabbath? Yes, you say, oh, but the Jews, they kept the Sabbath. Yeah, they kept a counterfeit Sabbath. They kept their own Sabbath that the Pharisees had created. But it wasn't God's Sabbath. It was a counterfeit Sabbath. But God had a people who kept the true Sabbath of the Bible. In fact, notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20. Jesus is speaking about the destruction of the city. And he says to his followers, when they see the sign and they have to flee, he says, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Do you think that might be true in the end time also? Pray that your flight not, may not be in winter because it will be very cold or on the Sabbath. Are God's end time people going to be Sabbath keepers? What about all the rest? What was the other sign? An eagle with what? With the sun. And people worshiping the eagle sun god, the abomination that led to desolation. By the way, national apostasy on the part of Israel led to what? To national ruin. In other words, the abomination led to desolation. Is what we've studied clear this evening? Is it vitally important for us to understand history in order to understand what's going to happen in prophecy? Yes! Because this prophecy has a twofold fulfillment. Two questions were asked by the disciples. What will be the sign of these things happening and also the sign of your coming and the end of the world? In our next study we're going to take a look at the fulfillment of this in the future. The parallel is amazing, and I pray to God that we will all be prepared for what will come.